give me a on a scale of one to ten, how November went for you. Scale of one to ten, how did November go for your trading? Oh, you guys can see each other's answers, so that means everybody's going to kind of skew it up a little bit, right? Isn't that how it goes? I know that is how it goes, but maybe. You're just soul searching and you're being honest with yourself and everyone else. Uh, sounds like you guys are doing pretty good. Overall, and that's okay. People who are doing great, 10, 10, really 10. I mean, really 10, maybe it's a 10. Or you know what I don't like to see? I don't like to see tens or ones because you know what you can always do better. Although, I mean, look, if November was like your best month or whatever, then okay, 10. But uh, you can always do better and no ones either. Like you guys are, are, are here, you're moving forward. Like you're putting in the effort. I love it. Like that automatically bumps you up to at least a two. All right. You, and somebody's very precise here. 7.5567. I love that, Christo. That's great. Okay. So um, let's get started here, shall we? I believe this is automatically recording. Right, 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 right. I think so. Stop, yeah, okay, good. So today we're gonna talk about top tips for trading time spreads. And this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And truth be told, I do say that about maybe five or six subjects, but uh, it's all true. Time spreads are one of the most powerful strategies out there, underused, underrated, and often misunderstood. So I'm excited to share my thoughts about it with you. Before we get started, excuse me, I need to point out options are not for everyone. You should read characteristics and risks or standardized options before trading. Get a copy of that by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. So this is what makes time spreads tick. This is what they're all about. Time spreads are one of the two mother strategies of options trading. The other is the vertical spread. Because look, there are plenty of folks who their whole, entire option trading revolves around buying calls. And there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that. In fact, there's two of my strategies that only revolve around buying calls. And I talked about them both, the red knockout and um, our short squeeze system. But outside of that, generally speaking, when you use spreads, you tend to get more edge, okay? And uh, I'm pretty sure we talked about edge in one of the five classes, this being the fifth class, so far this, this past uh, five weeks. Edge is basically a statistical advantage in your trading. And spreads really enable you to do that. They enable you to have a better risk reward. Uh, to have less risk and more reward, at least relative to each other. To capitalize on things you couldn't otherwise capitalize, like time and like volatility, that is a lot harder to do with pure directional trades. So vertical spreads is a spread where there's two different strike prices and time spreads are spreads where there's two different expirations. Now, time spreads, like I said earlier, they can be misunderstood, uh, and, they, and they are by a lot of traders. They, they just really oversimplify them and say, okay, I buy this one, I sell this one, as long as it stays between here and here, boom, I win. And is that true? Well, yeah, you know, um, is it true that if you get in your car and you just, you know, drive in a straight line by hitting the gas to get to your destination, you'll get there. Well, it's kind of true, but there's a little bit of other things you need to know. And that's how it is with time spreads. And the more you know about time spreads, the more of this edge you can get. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, you know, 
everything I know here on time squares. Here are the basics. So time spreads, which are also called calendar spreads, some folks will also call them horizontal spreads. Those are all synonyms. So one is not different than the other. That's when I buy one option and sell another option that are the same type, meaning they're both calls or they're both puts. They have the same strike price, but they have a different expiration, okay? Now there's, you can buy time spreads, have long time spreads, or you can sell time spreads, which is a short time spread. You are probably only ever going to do a long time spread. Me, I can't remember the last time I did a short time spread, except for when I was closing a long time spread. <clears throat> and that's because when you sell a time spread short, your broker margins you like a lot, like, like they, they make it prohibitive to trade it. And that's kind of okay because um, I would argue that there's not really a lot of use for short time spreads for retail traders. Um, so let's stick to what gives you the biggest bang for your buck. A long time spread is when I buy the option with more time until expiration. And so let's take a look at what a typical time spread might look like. So we've got, we're buying in this example, the October 22nd expiration, 143 calls. And at the same time as part of one spread, we're also selling the October 15th, 143 calls. So two different expirations, exact same strike, both calls. Buying the longer term one, selling the shorter term one. So the way we would say this is I'm buying the October 15th, October 22nd, 143 call time spread at 88 cents. Where do I get 88 cents? I'm paying 225, collecting a credit of 137. So 225 minus 137 means I'm paying 88 cents. Make sense? So the exposure of option trading, there's two different ways to look at it. And I'm calling it risk, but when I say that, I mean like risk of loss, but also possibility for reward. There's the absolute risk and the incremental risk. And it's not important that you memorize those, those phrases. I just want you to be able to, to, to think in these terms. Because if you want to be good at option trading, if you want to be great at option trading, you need to be great at both of those two things. Absolute risk is when we study the position with no time value left which is basically a profit and loss diagram. Incremental risk is our profitability or loss before expiration, as time passes, as volatility changes, as the underlying goes up or down a little bit, right? So absolute risk is the profit and loss diagram. So here's the thing. I just got off a call with one of my one-on-one -on -one coaching students and the one, and, and he's, he's been trading for, for a while. Like he's been trading stocks for 10 years, been trading options for a little bit. And he's, you know, he was like, Hey, I'm not really good with drawing these profit and loss diagrams. And I said, okay, look, you have to get good at these. Any retail trader needs to professional traders don't necessarily always look at it this way. Well, like volatility traders, delta neutral traders don't look at it this way, but everybody else does. Whether that's retail traders, big, huge institutional traders, this stuff is important. So I want everybody to get very, very good at drawing profit and loss diagrams. Now that said, when we're using two different expirations like we do in a time spread, profit and loss diagrams are only estimates. They're tough to draw. If I'm drawing a call time spread, that's the old hockey stick that many, maybe some of you are familiar with. Same with a covered call, that's sort of the upside down hockey stick. 
um, uh, vertical spreads like credit spreads, debit spreads. These are all we can draw exact points of break evens, exact points of maximum loss, maximum gain, exact points of you know everything. With time spreads, because there's two different expirations, we draw these at the point where the first option expires. That's the only logical way to do it. But then the second option still has some time premium left and we don't know what the implied volatility will be. So therefore we don't know what that option will be worth. That's why we can only estimate what the, excuse me, long time spread graph looks like. But basically there are a couple of things we know for sure. We know the most we can lose is what we pay for the spread. We know that the best case scenario is that it's at the shared strike price a second before expiration. And we know that if it moves too much in either direction, we can lose money. We want it to be in a range. More on this when we go through a real example. And then we want to look at the incremental risk. So that's basically your Greeks, Greeks risk. So two things, PL diagrams and Greeks risk. So with time spreads, our delta is going to be pretty close to zero if we're doing these as traditional time spreads. It can be a little bit positive or a little bit negative, depending if the, the underlying is above or below the strike price. Gamma. What do you guys think? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a little quiz here. Do you think on a traditional long time spread, is the gamma going to be positive or negative? Hit that chat box and let me know. Okay. Do we think that the gamma should be positive or negative? Mm, I like this. We're going to end up with a cage match here. We got some positives, some negatives. Might be a tag team cage match. We got a few of both. All right. Interesting. Good. So this is, this is going to lend itself to a great discussion. It's actually going to be negative. Now let's explore why that might be. So this is why it's so important to know your Greeks. This is my fifth and, and final, at least for now, presentation with, with um, options play. And kind of sad, I really love doing these things. But the first presentation that I did was on the Greeks. Why is that? Because to me, that is the most important thing about option trading. The better you are with understanding the Greeks, the better of a trader you're going to become. And a lot of this stuff isn't intuitive. You have, I mean, you have to learn it. So shorter term options have higher gamma and theta, but they have higher gamma. And whenever we sell options, we get negative gamma. When we buy options, we get positive gamma. So we're selling the one that has a big gamma and getting a lot of negative gamma. And we're buying the one that has a small gamma and getting just a little bit of positive gamma. So net, we end up with a negative gamma. And if you think about it, that's really what this is a picture of, isn't it? If negative gamma basically means in a nutshell, if the underlying moves too much in either direction, it hurts us. So if gamma is negative, theta must be, let's do another poll. Hit that chat box. What do we think with this traditional time spread? If we're buying the longer term option and selling the shorter term option, do we have positive or negative theta? Where's my chat box? There it is. We're getting positive, 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 and again a couple negatives. And I and I love. There's nothing I love more than just, hey, I don't know the answer. I'm here to learn, right? So we're gonna get neg, or excuse me. Oh my goodness, we're gonna get positive theta. Now, why is that? It's for the exact same reason. 
So those of you who have been studying options for a little bit, you came across some sort of education that told you that shorter term options have higher theta, because generally speaking, they do. We can fine tune that statement a little bit, but shorter term near the money options have higher theta. And that's why it's a lot of times better to sell shorter term options. That can be discussed a little bit as well, but a lot of times it is. So if we're selling the shorter term option, we're getting all this positive theta. And if we're buying the longer term option, we're getting a little bit of negative theta. So net, we have positive theta and therefore we make money as time passes. So the, the, the deal we're making here is basically like, we're think about it this way. We're basically getting paid to assume the risk of movement. If it moves too much, we lose. If it stays in a range, we make money as time passes. Very simple. And then with Vega, Vega is always going to be positive. Now, for right now, I'm not going to get too hung up on that, but we're going to revisit that later because that's actually a very key element. Well, volatility in Vega is a very key element of the edge procedure here with time spreads. So let's talk about edge. One way to think about your incremental risk or your Greek's risk is think about it in terms of direction and volatility. Direction is measured by your delta, but as I mentioned before, the delta should be close to zero. Little positive, little negative, doesn't matter. It should be close to zero. So our gamma and theta measure our realized volatility, excuse me, and our vega measures our implied volatility. So I've come up with something that is that I call the MTM trading plan checklist. And there are several steps here. We do our technical analysis. We identify the volatility events. We do a volatility analysis. We state a forecast, and then we select a strategy. Then we do the Greeks and risk analysis. We come up with our exit and adjustment plan, and then we execute, uh, well, no, then we come up with a strategy for executing the trade, then we execute it, and then we manage the trade. And then after we close the trade, we do a postmortem so we learn from our successes and our mistakes. Now, here's the important parts of this. There's going to be three analyses, technical analysis, volatility anal or uh, identifying the volatility events, which is the options traders version of fundamental analysis, I would say. Some people who have maybe an accounting background can take fundamental analysis a little bit further, especially for longer term trades. Fundamental analysis doesn't matter much for you know, swing trading or you know, even trades for a couple of weeks. That's better for investing. But as far as fundamental analysis goes for option traders, all we really care about is when are the volatility events. So we've got technical analysis, fundamental analysis, and volatility analysis. All that helps us to state a very concise forecast, and, and having a concise forecast enables us to select the best strategy to trade it. Which, what is the best strike? What's the best explorations? So for the technical setup, the risk for time spreads is what? If it moves too far, it's the negative gamma. So we're going to look for range bound stocks on a chart. We want to see both support and resistance. And we're going to estimate the break evens that by, by modeling out a profit and loss diagram so that they coincide with support and resistance. Ideally, we want the lower break even below support and the higher break even above resistance. Our fundamental setup is, again, the risk is negative gamma. So we want to avoid expected volatility events. If earnings is coming out tomorrow, we don't want to do a traditional time spread. Now, to be fair, I do use a strategy for trading earnings that involves time spreads, but it's a very, very different use than what we're talking about. 
if we're using time spreads in the sort of traditional most common way, we want to make money from time passing and we definitely want to avoid volatility events. So basically we're looking for stable, like boring old companies. Now the volatility analysis for time spreads is a little bit different than it typically is with most options. With most option trading, we're gonna to wanna to start with the volatility chart. We don't start with the volatility chart when it comes to time spreads because we don't really care. All we really care is volatility relative to each other, the term structure of volatility. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give you a refresher or a crash course here. There's two types of volatility when it comes to option trading. There's realized volatility and implied volatility. Realized volatility is basically like, forget everything you read in textbooks or, or you heard in a class. I'm just gonna tell you the way it is. Realized volatility is how much the underlying stock has moved around lately. That's it. It's, does it go like this all over the place or is it pretty stable, right? And the way we do that is we take the last, most platforms use the last 30 trading days. Uh, arguably, that's not the best way to do it. But, we, but generally speaking, they take the last 30 closing prices, find the standard deviation of that, and then annualize that number to make the last 30 days representative of one year period. Now, you might have heard the term historical volatility. That's a total synonym for realized volatility. And then we have implied volatility. Implied volatility is how cheap or expensive options are. Again, for a moment, forget about all the textbook stuff, all the stuff you heard in a class. All those definitions are valid, but the best definition is it's how cheap or expensive options are. Now, that said, what it is, you know, from a, a much more formal way is it's the volatility figure that when entered into an option pricing model yields a theoretical value reflecting current market prices. That's a mouthful, but that is technically how we arrive at that figure. Now, this is stated in terms of annualized standard deviation as well. So it's sort of apples to apples with realized volatility so we can compare the two with each other. A lot of people will say that it's interpreted as the market's estimation for the future volatility of, of a stock or ETF or whatever, but that is a gross oversimplification. There's, there's many, many uh, things wrong with that definition. And it's called implied volatility because it's thought to be the future volatility implied by option prices. But as you'll see, as we go through the rest of our analysis, that's a little bit flawed and you'd be holding yourself back if you believe that wholeheartedly. So the volatility spread is this. If you think about it, what we're really doing is we're buying, well, Literally, we're buying one option then selling another option with a different expiration. Whenever we buy options, we're, we're getting long implied volatility. We're getting positive vega. Whenever we sell options, we're getting negative implied volatility, negative vega. So we're buying volatility and selling volatility at the same time. This has an interesting nuance to it. And what that is, is the implied volatility of the option we're buying can be, and almost always will be, different the implied volatility of the option we're selling. This is called the term structure of volatility. Now I don't have that on the slide, so write that down, term structure of volatility. That's the observation that Options with the same strike, but different expirations can and will have different implied volatility values. Values. So if you're, if you're buying volatility, 
in one expiration and selling volatility in another expiration, what we always want to do under any circumstances is we want to buy low and sell high, right? So we want to be able to do that at the same time. And if we can, we're getting a volatility edge. So when we look at the implied volatility of the option we're buying, it should be lower than the volatility of the option we're selling. Now, there are a few risks to this. You will almost always see that relationship when earnings is coming out tomorrow, but we don't want to do this when earnings is coming out tomorrow. Or, you know, like these days, there's, you know, like the Fed really watches the unemployment figure, um, some of the inflation numbers when there's a Fed announcement um, thing, you know, like there's much more of a hawkish sentiment. And so we might not want to have on time spreads going into these, these big, you know, potentially volatile days either. So there's a lot to look out for, but like we still like basically we want no volatility events in the coming future, in the in the short-term coming future during the life of the short-term option and our spread. And we want to be able to buy a lower volatility than we're selling. And if we can do that, we can have a really powerful trade with edge. So let's look at a pretty realistic example here. So this is a chart, the prices are not current. This was Apple, it happened to be Apple. And as you can see, there's some support here and, and some resistance here. So the support is down around like 138 and a half or something. And the resistance, I drew some really nice fat lines so everybody can see them. And the resistance is up at like 146 or something like that. So now the stock hasn't necessarily been in a channel that whole time, but there's, there's definitely some support and resistance. In fact, there's even more resistance if we consider that the 50-day moving average is, is traditionally a support or resistance period as well. So we got a stock that's, and, and and to be fair, the stock has been in a channel for like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, for a, more than three weeks, basically almost a month. So we've got a stock that's that's been in a channel for about a month. And then we want to see when our earnings, and we can kind of see that on the chart, we can cheat a little bit, Earnings were like a couple of months ago. They're not going to be coming out for at least another month. So if we do a shorter term time spread, we're not going to run into earnings. And then we're going to look <clears throat> at the implied volatility. So we're going to revisit the same example in Apple. We're buying the October 22nd, 143 calls, selling the October 15th, 143 calls. So we'd be buying a 24.16 volatility and selling a 25.56 volatility. So we're basically selling an implied volatility that's 1.4 points higher than the one we're buying. Excuse me. So we're locking in a reasonable amount, uh, you know, at least a small amount of edge. So we've got a couple of things going for us, right? First of all, if the underlying stays in a range, which it's been in a range for a month, we can win. And because we're buying low and selling high at the same time here, it, it makes the cost of our spread lower. I believe I went over this in another uh, presentation over the last uh, four weeks before this. So we get a better, a little bit of a better trade here because of that edge. Most we can lose is what we pay for the trade, which is 88 cents. And the best case scenario is we want it to be trading right around 143, right around expiration. So now let's look at our, that, that's our PL diagram, our absolute risk. Now let's look at our Greeks, our incremental risk. So our delta is pretty much zero, positive one. That's basically zero. It's like being along one share of stock. Our theta is nine cents. So that, and how do we arrive at that? Well, like if we're, if we're buying these, we're losing 11 cents a day. 
And if we're selling these, we're collecting 20 cents a day. So we're collecting net nine cents a day. On a one lot, that's $9 of money every day that we're making, right? Over for 10 days, that's 90 cents, which is $90 of money. So like this adds up, it's, it's, it's real money and it's a relevant factor to look at. The Vega is four cents, but what's more important to me is the fact that if there is no volatility event scheduled during the life of the October 15th contract, then these implied volatilities probably shouldn't be different than one another. If they are, it's just noise. And so probably this implied volatility is likely to fall and come down to this volatility. So even though the Vega is positive, we could, we could make money on volatility falling if only the front volatility falls. And these, and that's the like the big like tip I can give you on time spreads is that the volatilities of each of those options does move independent to one another. So what do we want to see happen? Well, on our PL diagram, we want our stock to remain between the break-evens. And, and your option platform probably enables you to model out the trades and it'll draw a PL diagram for you. You should get good at doing it yourself, but it's hard with time spreads. So model it out, estimate your break-evens. And if you look at your support and resistance and say, yeah, it looks like we'll stay between those two points, it might be a trade that you like. The volatility edge is a benefit. It's not the most important thing, but it does make your trade stronger, makes your risk lower and your reward better and your break evens wider. If the stock moves outside the estimated break evens, that's where our management kicks in. And we're either going to close the trade to take a small loss before it becomes a big one or maybe do an adjustment by rolling the strike or maybe rolling it into a double calendar. We will want to take this off before expiration. Usually close to expiration day is when I like to take these off. We gotta wait until we get pretty close to expiration to maximize our value, but we don't wanna hold it all the way until expiration because that's when we could end up getting assigned or automatic exercise or that kind of thing, which turns this into a completely different trade. All right, Whew. we covered a lot. I pretty much laid out basically just about everything you need to know about how to trade time spreads like a professional, but in a retail account, how to get edge doing it. So now it is time, ladies and gentlemen, for your questions. So let's see here. Um, Anonymous says, say you have a long called diet. Well, we didn't talk about diagonals, right? We, we did not talk about diagonals. Um, but I guess we can get into that. And a diagonal, by the way, is a combination of a time spread and a vertical spread. It's when we have two different expirations and two different strikes. Typically, what a lot of people will do with call diagonals is they'll buy an in the money longer term and sell an out of the money shorter term. So this question is, say you have a long call diagonal and the underlying drops in value, but you're still bullish and want to stay in the trade. If the long leg gets to a point where the delta is dropped, say below 25, how do you determine whether to roll the entire spread to get back to a 50 delta or keep the 25 delta long leg and sell another call to continue. So with this, again, it's slightly off topic, but I wouldn't get hung up on the deltas. Like that's the least relevant part of this. And, and plus, most of the time you're gonna be using more than a 50 delta. It's very commonplace for people to buy in the money long-term calls. So that means the long-term call itself will have more than a 50 delta. So don't get hung up on the delta. Instead, use the chart. Why did you, you know, like this is a hypothetical question uh, because it's because your question was hypothetical. Why did you get into the trade? It's probably because you saw something on the chart. Maybe there was support and it was bouncing off support and there was some relative strength or 
you know, you know, RSI or maybe there was slow stochastics or something that you were using, did it fall below support? Did the RSI tick down? Did the relative strength index, you know, cross below the 20%? If those things happened, then you, that might nullify the whole thesis of your trade. And you might not want to be in the trade anymore. But if those things didn't happen and you're still bullish, it might not require any change. So don't get hung up on the delta. That's, that's just a, it's a different shiny red ball. Yang, what's up, my friend? He says, how is IV related to stock price? Are they related? For example, if the stop drops, drops significantly, the option price will also drop significantly because of delta. But is the IV actually high because the stock price is volatile? Yeah, yeah, you're on to something, Yang. So it's it's not because the stock price is volatile, but there is this inverse relationship. When stocks go down, implied volatility tends to go up. And the reason for that is when stocks go down, that's when people typically buy puts because they're afraid it can go down a lot and they, they protect themselves. And then when stocks go back up, they sell those puts because they don't need them or they'll sell covered calls to generate income. And that makes volatility go down. So when one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Good, good questions. Good questions. Uh, let's see here. Let's talk with Carson. Carson said, you mentioned you have an alternate, alternate strategy for calendars around earnings. Will you elaborate on that in another lecture by chance? Uh, I might. Like th this... I was filling in for Tony uh, so he could spend some time with the new family. Uh, as maybe some of you know, Tony had a, a, a baby recently, um, he and his wife, and he's going to be back. So um, if I end up coming back and filling in, yeah, I'm, I might be able to do that. And it's one of my favorite strategies, earnings time spreads. Gobel said, you said the theta is positive for this calendar trade. But for this example, in the Apple trade, you show a negative theta of nine cents. Did I have negative theta? Oh, that good catch, man. You are paying attention. That is a typo and I need to fix that. That is why I always keep post-it notes in the drawer next to me. And I'm gonna say, fix that slide. You get the gold star of the day, my friend, for catching that mistake. Uh, Carson says, when you buy these, what's the optimal time to expiration from the front expiration? And what's the optimal time difference between the front and back? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I didn't say that. So um, I tend, I mean, typically I'm selling the expiration with less than 15 days, I'm usually doing weeklies. There's just a lot more liquidity in options that have weeklies. And it's not necessarily a rule. I don't exclusively do weeklies, but I like to sell with less than 15 days. And then I like to buy, it sort of depends. Remember, I always like to buy a lower volatility than I'm selling and the lower I can buy, the better. So if I'm selling say a 30 volatility and I can buy a 29 volatility the week after, that's pretty good. But if I go out, if I skip a week and I go out two weeks to buy and I can buy a 27 volatility, that's a three point difference, that's even better. And if I go out one more week and I can buy a 25 volatility, that's even better. Plus that gives me some room to roll if it's working out and that becomes like a whole nother webinar on, on managing these, but um, Usually between the two expirations, I would say typically it's about two weeks. That's usually sort of the sweet spot. Great questions. Emmanuel says, where, uh, <clears throat> where can we listen to you after Tony's back? I am around my friend and um, you can find me. I'm around, <laughs> I'm all over the place. And who knows, maybe I'll come back and I'll fill in uh, 
again, if, uh, you know, Tony decides to go for number two. Jeffrey says, is the risk of grief, uh, actually, let me start. What about logging? What metrics do you use to record for your postmortem? Yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> I mean, for my earnings time spreads, I have a whole spreadsheet that I keep. But I mean, I, I would look at things like I would record what are my Greeks when I make the trade. I would record what were the volatilities when I make the trade. I would record my profit and loss. I would record the which expirations and, and how many days to expiration they had. <clears throat> and like, and doing those things, you know, are, I think are gonna help you really dial in and, and know what to watch. Great question, I love that. OJQ says backwardation. So yeah, I love that, man. Yeah, that is, it's, I guess we could call that backwardation, right? That's just, term structure. Usually we use the terms backwardation for uh, for futures term structure. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you can use that same phrase here too. Great, JQ. I love that, man. Or, or woman. <laughs> um, not sure what JQ stands for. Uh, what's your go-to option strategy for low or high volatility? Well, when there's a differential in the volatilities, time spreads almost always. Other than that, it, it depends on what my directional bias is. You know, <clears throat> if I just think the stock won't rise very much, I'll do a call credit spread. If I just think it won't fall very much, I'll do a put credit spread. That's if volatility is high, right? If volatility is low, and I think I'll make a small directional move, I might do a, a, a bull call spread or bear put spread if I think it's going to go down if volatility is low. Um, you know, like, I mean, instead of just saying, you know, what's my go-to strategy, which basically those are, you know, just think about it in terms of always be paying attention to, always be paying attention to, um, you know, what your volatility position is. If volatility is cheap, you want to have positive vega. If volatility is expensive, you want to have negative vega. With the exception of time spreads, because we don't really care about the net vega with time spreads. We only care about the differential in the term structure. Max says, so how do you make money? You make money on theta and, and not lose money on gamma. As long as the stock doesn't move too much, so I lose money on gamma. If it stays between those break-evens, I make money on theta. Will this webinar recording be available to us? Yes, it will. Hey, Nias, how you doing, my friend? Long time no talk. Um, it'll be posted. I think that the good folks at Options Play email it out the next day. That's what they typically been doing. Gary says, pros and cons of using long calls versus short puts to execute the calendar. So either way, if it's calls or puts, we're always buying the longer term and selling the shorter term. It doesn't matter. Because syn theoretically, synthetically, they're equivalent. So you're seldom going to do a time spread that is exactly at the money. For example, this one. Apple was at 142.81, and the closest to the money was the 143 strike. It's slightly out of the money. If we were at like 142.20, the closest strike would be the 142 calls, and I would probably do the 142 puts calendar instead because the puts would be out of the money. I always like to do the out of the monies because they have less slippage. How do you determine the distance between a long and short? Ken, we just talked about that. I answered somebody else's question. Sherry, how do you pick your strike price and expiration dates? Talked about, I, okay, we just talked about both of those. Um, is there, is, is, their risk of Greeks applied to diagonal call spread, also known as poor man's covered call. Yeah, so like with, I mean, a diagonal is very different than this. I mean, it is a diagonal is a type of time spread, but there's two different strikes. 
So you're you're gonna end when you do it as a poor man's calls uh, covered call, you're gonna get a positive delta. You may or may not have a positive theta. It might be negative. And again, it, uh, I'm acknowledging the typo here. Unfortunately, um, this is, should be a positive theta. So yeah, uh, like the Greeks are a little bit different, and I I don't have any canned examples here, so I can't spend. I can't spend a lot of time on that, but yeah, it, it's it's a different type of trade for sure. I mean, the, the main difference is going to be delta. Max says, so to make money, the price needs to be sufficiently higher to cover the call bought, but you would then lose money on the call sold. Yeah, and so look, with the same strike, a shorter term call is always going to be a lower price than the longer term call. But the relative price implied volatility should be higher. It could be higher or lower, but we're only gonna choose to do the, the time spread if implied volatility is higher. So the idea, like just think about it in terms of theta. The one you're selling loses a lot of money. The one you're buying loses a little bit of money. The one you're buying is basically a hedge. It gets you to being delta neutral and it gives you limited loss. So it's okay to lose a little bit of money on hedges if you're making a lot of money on the on, on the trade component of it. Oh, sure, for John Q. Oh, oh, hold on a second. I didn't. Oh, Jake. Yeah. Got it. I like it. I like it. All right. Uh, a couple more questions and then we're going to call it a day. Uh, Khalil says, do you recommend any book on option Greeks? You mentioned you have written a book. Yeah, I, I mentioned that very, very briefly in passing during our first webinar. Um, I, I did write a book called Trading Option Greeks, which is, um, I mean, yeah, I spent a lot of time on it and, and packed a lot in there. So I do recommend it. Um, I'm, I'm biased, but I'm biased because I, I spent a lot of time on it to make it very valuable. The Greeks video is on you. Cool, cool, cool. Great, Jay. Uh, Carson says, for closing the trade, do you let the front expire completely or do you close the front at any particular? Yeah, no, you need to close this before expiration. Do not hold it until expiration. Close before expiration. You, you're you gonna leave some pennies on the table and that's totally okay. If you don't, here's what could happen. You could end up with like a stock position and you can end up in a, in a situation where you've got a huge Delta, like close before expiration. Good, I'm glad you asked that so I could clarify. Do you recommend multiple monitors for the average retail trader? I do. I do everything on a laptop so that I can pick it up and carry it with me because I travel a fair amount for business and pleasure. Um, but when I'm at home uh, in MTM World Headquarters here, which is my house, my home office, because we all work remotely, there's like 20 of us or something. Um, I'm sitting here with my laptop and then three external monitors. So you're going to need a good graphics card, uh, good memory. Jay says, how do you know if vol is low? Do you just track it like price? I mainly only care about this one versus this one. I mean, if we, if we want to take it to another level, we can compare it with historical volatility and we don't want it to be too high above historical. We'd rather have, in a perfect world, we'd want to buy one below historical and sell one above, but that almost never lines up. So we, we mainly care about them relative to each other and nothing else. Reginald, what's up, man? Long time no talk. Says, what do you consider a significant difference between the implied volatility to warrant doing the time spread? Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, you probably want it to be at least two points, but if the markets are very tight, like they are in Apple, um, you know what? You know, even one point is okay. But you know, like you don't want it to be like just a tenth of a volatility point. It's just not enough. 
So for, for, for most trades, I would say you want it to be at least two points, but on those extremely liquid ones like Apple, spiders, what have you, where the bid ask spreads are super narrow, even one point is okay. You want it to be not more than 20 points though, because otherwise that means there might be something that you missed. And Wayne asks, while this voltage works for weeklies, does it also work well for monthlies? Yeah, you should only do it in, in monthlies also if you have the volatility edge. It doesn't, you don't see it as, yeah, I mean, yeah, you should only trade it whether it's weeklies or monthlies, absolutely. Gene says, why do I care about this stuff if I use option play? Because option play is designed to like, how do you think options play works, right? Like options play is the shortcut, you know? It's like, hey, I, you know, I don't need to know how to drive a car because all I do is take taxis because it's easy to take taxis. Like options play makes everything super easy for you, but don't you want to understand how it works? Like if you're a race car driver, like, yeah, here's the gas, here's the brakes, go drive. Like maybe that'll work got a really fast car, you might win the race. But if you like really understand what's going on in the car, you're going to be able to drive it better. You're going to be able to use options play even better if you understand this stuff. Uh, Charlie says, what happens if both calls go in the money, say two days before the short call expires? Yeah. So if the stock goes through the projected break even, you need to manage your risk. Look, like, look, you need to manage risk with all trades. There's no option strategy that's intended to be set it and forget it. Just put it on and come back three weeks later and see what happened. Like that doesn't work. So if it starts getting away from you and you start losing money, you should close the trade and, and take a small loss before it becomes big or, or roll it. And, and there are some adjustment strategies, but that's a little out of the scope of what we have time for today. Yang says, what stop loss in terms of percentage would you set for time spreads? So you can't really set a, a stop loss with spreads. Uh, otherwise, you end up getting filled at a dreadfully horrible price that you'll be sorry you got filled at. So what I do instead is I monitor it. And if it goes through the break evens, I'm going to manually close it. Uh, Sherry says, I'm really bad with drawing P&L diagrams as well. For some reason, my brain just shuts down. I see all the hockey sticks. What do you recommend that I do to beef up my knowledge and ability to draw P&L diagrams? Well, you need two things. You need a piece of paper and a pen. No, you need three things. Piece of paper, pen, and time. Practice, 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 Sherry. You will get better at it as time passes. And it's tedious and it's time consuming and it just feels like, uh, but you know, it's like exercising too. And truth be told, I haven't been exercising as much lately as I usually like to, usually like to run three or four times a week. And I have been letting that slide lately, um, you know, because it takes a lot of time and I've been pretty busy lately. But um, the thing is, is take the time, exercise that brain, that part of you uh, that draws P&L diagrams. It's a really, really useful thing. Um, yes, options play picks the optimum option. I understand the Greeks, but options play does all the math. The only thing I need to figure out is the technical. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. And that's why it's great. Again, if you're a race car driver, you're going to be a better race car driver if you know how to do the math and you're good at it and you can do it in your head. You know, like that is, that is a fact. Like, do you want a, a, a surgeon who like, you know, yeah, oh, just tell me where to cut. Yeah, it'll, it'll be fine. Or do you want a guy who really understands the inner workings of the, of the body? You know, the more you learn, the more you earn when it comes to trading, man. Uh, your, your trading platform would generate your risk profile when you model the trade. Yeah, and, and so Ken, that's true. Your, your, your trading platform will generate your risk profile when you model the trade, but I mean, what I would recommend, Sherry, is draw it out yourself and then do what Ken said and then model it 
and see if what you drew on a piece of paper matches what your broker did. That's how you check yourself. All right, I'm gonna take one more question, then we're gonna call it a day. Uh, do you have any general ideas on how often the strategy returns profit in a back test? Uh, I mean, no, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to use this. We covered like, you know, 90% of what you need to know, uh, but no, that would be hard to do because if you do a back test, you're always doing this expiration versus this expiration. I like to optimize that manually. So yeah, unfortunately not, but you get a lot of edge with this strategy. It's one of the most powerful strategies that I know. And I hope that everything we covered today was super helpful. Thank you very much for attending my session and for allowing me to fill in for Tony. He'll be back next week. And hey, trade well. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, guys. See ya.